10.6 is inverse trig functions. And before we get into specifically inverse trig functions, I'm gonna talk about functions in general. One way to think about functions is going from a set of numbers to another set of numbers. They just upgraded, oh, there we go. I was using gray. All right, so our function goes from one set to another set and the set on the left is called the domain domain of f and the set on the right is called the range so what a function does it takes an element inside the domain so it'll take a number here we're usually going to use uh, the letter x to represent that quantity and it's gonna send it to some other number, and it is the number x, and then applying that function. And usually we're gonna use letter y for anything in the range. So that's uh, basics of functions. The, the only function rule there is, each x in the domain goes to exactly one uh, element in the range. So I'll write that down, function rule. function rule and domain of f goes to one y in the range of f and this y we usually write as uh, f of x. All right, so that's the only function rule. If you satisfy this property, then uh, this uh, this idea of taking elements in the domain and sending them to the range is a function. So what we're about to do is talk about inverse functions. And inverse functions, what they do is they go the opposite direction of a function. Inverse functions, we use a notation. It looks like a exponent with a negative one value but that really means inverse. So this means the inverse uh, the inverse function of regular f of x. Okay, what does it mean to be an inverse function? That's just the note, uh, this right here is just the notation. Uh, the inverse function undoes the original function. Hopefully that's a word, undoes. Undo is a word, uh, but f inverse undoes f. And so what that means is any element over here in the range of f, although when we're thinking about the inverse function, f inverse, f inverse would not tell you that this element is in the range of f. f inverse would say, oh, that element is in the domain of f inverse. And that's it. Oh, no. f inverse. Oh. Domain of f inverse of f inverse. And f inverse will take this number right here. We could use the letter y for it. Um, I don't want to think about the original letters we assigned. What I'm going to do, because we're thinking about uh, f inverse right here, the inverse function, I'm going to call this x, and it's going to get sent over here to some other number, and it will be f inverse of x. Now what would happen if we took whatever this number is and we fed it back into f, so we took this, fed it back through the f function, and where would it go over here? Well, the idea of undoing a function, so what that means is if you do f inverse, this should undo f. So if you apply, if you take f inverse and then f, you should get back to where you started. And I better use another color for this, so. If you apply them both, you'll get back to where you started. 
So if you apply F inverse and then F, you get to where you started. And likewise, if you start over here, first apply F, get to here, and then apply F inverse, you should get back to where you started. So these, this property, this undoing property, what this really means in algebraic notation, F of F inverse of X equals X. And also the other order, F inverse of F of X equals X. Now this is not for uh, all numbers X, but this is any X in. Now you have to look who is, uh, now a word I like to use is for functions uh, when they're inputting values, I like to think about it as this function is eating the input value X. So this F inverse of X, this only makes sense for any X in domain of F inverse. And likewise for the other uh, cancellation property, this is for any X in domain of regular F because that's who, if you look here, you're just looking at who's eating first. So F of X, that means F is eating first and up above, right here F inverse of X is uh, inputting before this function F is. There's another function notation uh, for composition that I don't like as much. And I'll write that over here. Usually we're using letters F and G for function composition. So this is alternative composition notation. So this sometimes people get a little silly with the name and they call it fog because that it's not an O is a it's supposed to be a circle. That's a little bit smaller, not quite a dot, um, but that means F composed with G, but generally this is more useful. So I'm gonna be using that notation. And while we're talking about notation, I wanna warn you about this, uh, what looks like exponential notation. So this means the inverse function. not the reciprocal. So what do I mean by the reciprocal? Well, I'll write in red because these are not gonna be equal. So F inverse of X does not mean one over F of X or the reciprocal of F of X. Uh, there is one function that this is true for, and it happens to be the 1 over x function, but that's the only function whose inverse is also reciprocal. So in general, this is very not true. So now we talked about the notation, uh, and the this algebraic property is really important. It It's from pre-calculus 1, so it should be, uh, you should have already seen it before, but this is just the algebraic cancellation of the inverse function. Now in order for the inverse to exist, you have to have the original function, uh, the original function needs to be one to one. And it turns out that's the only thing that needs to be satisfied for a function to be invertible or to have an inverse function. So we can make something stronger than the if statement. Uh, f of x has an inverse function exactly when f of x is 1 to 1. And of course, we're going to get lazy and write 1-1 for 1 to 1. 
All right, so f of x has an inverse function when the function is one to one. So what does it mean to be one to one? I don't know why I'm writing it out or spelling it out. A one to one function. Now, it's gonna sound very similar to the single, the only rule you need to pass to be a function. The only difference is, there's a few ways to write it. One way to write it is unique. Uh, so each element in the domain has its own unique value in the range, meaning it is not shared. There's no other x value whose uh, output is the same y value. So unique. when f is one to one. All right, so that's what it means to be one to one. So one to one function each x in domain has and I'll say has its own unique has its own unique uh, value in the range. Uh, now, in the English language, unique, at least at some point, meant one of a kind. So it has its own uh, y value. You can check this. Well, we don't need to worry about the algebra check on this because we're going to look at a graph. Uh, now on a graph, a one to one function. Uh, what does that mean on a graph? So if we graph the a one to one function. So I'm going to do the easiest example that's not one to one that I can draw in a couple seconds. So this function is kind of boring. It only has two points. It's got one one and two one. So if we look at this function, right here, what happens when you take one and f it? Well, our output is one. So input one, output is one. Now there's only other, one other uh, element in the domain that I can input, which is two. What is the output? What is f of two? You also get one. So this is a problem because one and two share an output. And this word each might not draw enough attention. So we'll switch it to every. So what that means is every single element in the domain has a unique output. So all you have to do to break this is just find two elements in the domain that share an output and all of a sudden your function cannot be one to one. And that's what this example is right here. Here's two inputs who share an output. So they do not have a unique output. The way we're gonna sidestep this, all, all of our functions, we just graphed them, they all are uh, not one to one. The test for one to oneness is the horizontal line test. Now functions themselves have to pass a vertical line test, uh, which is, you can think of it as the inverse condition. Uh, but a one-to-one -one, uh, func function needs to pass the horizontal line test. And what is a horizontal line test? Every horizontal line intersects the function in at most one location. Or one point, I should say.
So this is the horizontal line test. So next up, we're gonna look at the sine function and we're gonna force it to pass the horizontal line test. The way we're gonna do it is sort of cheap. We're gonna actually change the domain of the function. So we're gonna say, all right, we cannot have one and two in this uh, domain. So we're gonna throw away two. So we're gonna just take it out of the domain, which means that's not a point of the function anymore. And look at that. All of a sudden our function is one to one and we have an inverse. So that's what we're gonna do, except we're gonna do it to the sine function first. And we're gonna have to work a little harder than just erasing a single point. 